The Crypt Interviews, in association with Mayo Legend Point Castle Bar. You're listening to The Crypt, and my special guest today on the show is Andrea Perrin. Andrea has joined me on the show before because it was her family who endured the haunting that the James Wan movie The Conjuring was based on. So I'm delighted to have you back on the show, Andrea. Oh, it's great to be with you again, Rita. I've missed you so much. You're such a delight. (laughs) Thank you so much. Well, Andrea, when you were on before, it was before The Conjuring came out. So, you know, you have so many of these horror movies to come out saying it's based on a true story. And you have people saying, oh, they're making it up just to get money and all this kind of stuff. But your story happened so many years before this ever came to be made into a movie. What would you say to those people who who say that, that it's all made up just to make money? Uh, well, <laughs> um, I don't really care what they think because I know the truth. You know, I'm not a wealthy woman. We barely made anything from... Uh, uh, the Conjuring, that was uh, a work of uh, predominantly fiction, mm-hmm. uh, fully, completely Hollywood, or Holly weird, as I like to call them. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, my message out into the world about spirit, about spirituality, about connectedness, um, is much larger than anything fiscal or financial. Um, that is, you know, yes, I sell my books only because I can't afford to give them away. If I could, I would. <laughs> um, you know, I lecture around the country. Uh, I'm doing a, a lecture via Skype in Wales uh, this summer. Uh, you know, it's and I do it for free and I do it for free because the message is far more important than the money. They're not on the same list. They don't they're not even relevant to each other. So, uh, yes, I feel uh, perfectly comfortable in saying that uh, I don't care what anybody thinks. Most people who have a negative opinion or attitude about our story know absolutely nothing about it at all, Um, have maybe seen the movie, have very likely not read my trilogy of books, uh, which actually chronicles the real events that occurred over the course of a decade of my family living in that home. And the three books, uh, volume one begins before we even move to the house. And the third volume uh, ends when we've already left. And everything that happened in between. Um, It's not a horror story. The Conjuring was, I guess, for some people, horrifying. Um, But maybe about 5% of that is actually true. Uh, mostly it's a depiction using our names and likenesses, but uh, is not the story um, that was uh, lived by the seven of us in my family. Um, That was much more a love story, in my opinion, much more a story of the strength of a bond uh, in a family, uh, getting through difficulties together. Um, It's a spiritual journey. It's a supernatural odyssey. Uh, yes, there are places in my books that are, are some describe as horrifying. Some people write to me and say, you know, I can't sleep with the lights off anymore. You know, and I'm so sorry yeah. about that. Uh, but uh, The Conjuring, um, well, let me give you the, the five-minute overview, Rita, okay. so that we can just uh, uh, cover all that ground. Because, yes, I did forget that uh, you had me on your show when I was just an author and not tied to a half a billion dollar movie. Mm-hmm. Um, it did get our story out in the world, uh, or elements of it anyway, uh, in ways that virtually nothing else could. Um, for that, I am very grateful. I always will be. That's the upside. The downside is that I am going to be explaining to people for the rest of my natural born days that Annabelle the doll had absolutely nothing yeah. to do with our story yeah. and was a uh, it was literally weaved into the, the manuscript, the, um, the screenplay, to set up the second film in a series of films, uh, the second one being Annabelle, um, and to, uh, I guess, denote that the Warrens were paranormal investigators that had done uh, investigations prior to ours, and subsequently, as the film ends, with them taking a call from what would be 
uh, the house in Amityville, the Amityville Horror, which uh, they um, investigated after our farmhouse. You know the way I look at this, Andrea? This is back in the 70s. You're a family. There's paranormal activity in your house. You bring in two paranormal investigators to help you. You're not to know that Hollywood is going to come knocking 30 years later to make a movie on this. You know? No, of course not. No, you know, there were hundreds of people, perhaps thousands of people in our hometown when we lived there who knew exactly what was going on at the farm. Um, and, you know, subsequently, some of them embraced us and some of them shunned us. Uh, some of them hurled accusations at us. Uh, it's no different now. I mean, Rita, I just had to get to a point in my life where I didn't care what other people thought anymore. The message was far more important yeah. uh, than the messenger. And, um, and that had to be true and had to hold true for every single member of my family. You know, we all reached an age where we realized, as my mother once said, um, this is far too important to uh, a story to take to the grave, that it's if you experience something like this, it's incumbent upon you to share it with others and let them know that spirit does exist and that that can be a very hopeful concept. Mm -hmm. That can be a, a very um, a peaceful feeling to know that we do go on, that we're, it's not just ashes to ashes, dust yeah. to dust in terms of our spirit. That only pertains to the vessel. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I am showered with criticism on a day-to-day -day basis and, uh, and I don't listen to it. I completely ignore it. Um, see, the thing is, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, those who don't get it, mm -hmm. really, I can't afford for them to matter until they do. Those that do get it come to me in droves. And they're the ones that I communicate with that um, are being uplifted by the story, that uh, come to understand the true nature of it, the true significance of it, the profundity of it, the miraculousness of it. Um, it is, uh, you know, it, it's truly, truly a spiritual odyssey. It's a journey. Um, and that's what I wanted to share with people. I can't tell you how many letters I receive from folks around the world who say, you know, I used to be so afraid of what I experienced when I was a kid. I never told anybody in my family. I, I grew up, I got married, I never told my spouse, and then I read your story, and now I tell everyone. There is some element of our true story that liberates people to speak their truth, and that's what I'm grateful for. That's what I'm happy about. It's the cherry on top. You know, the, the Conjuring was a good piece of art. Uh, in terms of filmmaking. I thought James Wan did a very good job with it. The cast, the crew, everybody put their heart and soul into it. I met them all. Uh, I know them all. And every single person that worked on that film was very well aware that they were depicting living people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, except for, of course, Ed Warren, who's passed away. Um, Lorraine Warren and every member of our family uh, had someone who played us in that movie and they were all keenly aware of the responsibility that ensues when one does that even the youngest child on the set um i couldn't ask for people more devoted to the cause uh, they had a lot of experiences on the set and uh, subsequently a lot of them won't talk about making the movie now and i won't tell their stories for them that's up to them to do i will tell you that um, there were cosmic kisses in, um, in The Conjuring. There were things that told me from the moment I sat down in a private screening three months prior to the opening of the film in July of 2013, Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema very graciously brought myself and Mrs. Warren to Hollywood to see this film and to do a series of interviews. And I will tell you that when I saw it, and I realized that as the camera was swinging around into Shanley Caswell's room, there's a picture on the mantle board of a cat, a white cat. It's folk art. I don't even know if it's paint by number, but what it is is identical to one that I've had in my life since I was 13 years old that my mother's best friend gave me when we lived at the farm. There is no conceivable way that they could have known to duplicate that picture in that movie. 
in the same way there's no conceivable way they could have known to duplicate the set of wind chimes that Cindy ran through the house carrying uh, to hang on the porch. We had a set identical to them. Um, it's, there's so many things. Nobody ever told them that our dog died as soon as we moved to the farm. They put that in there on their own, almost as if they was they were channeling the information from us and none of us shared that with them. That is so uh, strange. And it goes on and on and on. I could tell you, I could talk to you for a solid hour about the discrepancies and the kisses. Uh, the wallpaper, there are 25,000 plus different designs of colonial wallpaper on the open market. They chose the one wallpaper that we had hanging in our house and they never saw any photographs of the inside of the house. Oh my That's gosh. impossible. That's reason enough to go play the national lottery. That is crazy. Now, I know, you know, so I have to accept it with open arms, with gratitude in my heart that they at least began to tell our story. But there was no exorcism in our house. Ed Warren was a devout Roman Catholic who was the only layman in the world at the time that had been trained in the practice of exorcism, and he was trained only as an assistant. He would have considered it a slap in the face of God to try to conduct one on his own. And Lorraine Warren came unglued when she saw that scene because of that, yeah. because she knew that he would consider it an insult to those priests who trained him uh, to try to conduct one on his own. I mean, there was so much that was fabricated. There was so much hyperbole. There was so much that was exaggerated beyond belief. And yet there were many, many elements of our story that were touched upon in very subtle ways. Uh, the Warrens did not move in with us. My mother never sought them out. Uh, they were brought to us by someone else. Um, you know, it goes on and on. I mean, literally, I could spend an hour telling you, but I will tell you uh, in the overview that they did get it right. Good conquers evil, love conquers fear, and the Perrin family endured an extreme haunting that they all survived. Now, the movie represents all of those points well. But the thing that upsets me the most is that because of what Mrs. Warren had uh, written in her notes, which is what the film is actually based on, the case files of Ed and Lorraine Warren, she blamed Bathsheba Sherman mm -hmm. for everything negative that happened in our home. And that simply was not the case. The spirit that um, <clears throat> was in a, a, an oppositional force to my mother in the household, the woman who perceived herself to be mistress of the house long after her demise was the one that was attacking my mother and making things so difficult for her. And she died well before Bathsheba Sherman was born. So they got that really wrong. They got the exorcism really wrong. They got a lot of things really wrong, but they also got some things right. And they did it. Um, they they did it because in this particular case, the truth was stranger than fiction, and they were afraid to tell the whole real story and run people out of the theater, and that's the truth. Well, then, of course, because Bathsheba was the blame for everything in the movie, didn't people go and vandalize the headstone? Yes, someone did, and I made a video right after it happened. I was so angry. I was so aggravated. And I said something akin to, um, you know, I don't know who you are, but she does, and woe be unto you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, some idiot teenager, some lunatic fringe, who knows, that decided that, uh, you know, her, her headstone that had been standing there since 1885 deserved to be um, crumbled. Uh, absolutely uh, despicable act, uh, a savage act of uh, desecration. Yeah. And uh, to this day, I'm, I'm so still filled with disgust that it even happened. Uh, now the very fine people of Harrisville, Rhode Island, keep a very close eye on that graveyard. Um, Bathsheba is buried there. Her husband, Judson, is buried beside her. And uh, her four children are buried around her. The three youngest, all who perished before the age of four, um, are buried right beside her. And the only son that survived her, um, Herbert, is buried just adjacent to her. Um, 
Yeah, it, it, she was accused in some circles of being a witch, and that's what they latched onto for the conjuring. Uh, you know, in, in volume three of my series, uh, I write extensively about that and how, you know, there's no, there's no evidence anywhere that Bathsheba Sherman was a practicing witch. It was, she was the victim of rumor and innuendo. And I don't know for certain what she did or did not do in her life, but I know that she is, is haunted. She is haunted by that black cloud that, that hung over her in life and followed her into death. And it could all be based on nothing but a series of rumors and vicious innuendo about her. Now, the story that I tell in the book about her comes from the town historian who was a very old man when we met him uh, right after we moved to the farm. And he's the one that told my mother the story of Bathsheba Sherman and what she was accused of, etc. cetera. Um, and I included that in the book but I likewise treated it very fairly and with a very even hand in terms of delving deeply into the hauntings that occurred in the house or the, the spiritual activity in the house. Um, and there were many of them. She was certainly not the only one. She never even lived in the house. She um, supposedly had some uh, connection to it in that she was uh, taking care of an infant uh, in that house when the baby died and was subsequently um, uh, accused of causing the baby harm. There was an inquest. She was absolved. Uh, it never went to a trial. Um, she answered all of the questions to the satisfaction of the judge, and it was dismissed. But in the court of uh, public uh, approval, discretion, uh, opinion, uh, in the court of the public, she was tried and convicted and lived a miserable life being uh, referred to as uh, a witch who had sold her soul to the devil with the sacrifice of an infant for uh, an exchange for eternal youth and beauty. Um, she died an old woman in 1885. She was born in 1812. This was a real person who was depicted in that film. And my heart broke when I saw how she was treated, when in fact the offending spirit in that house was not her at all. And it's mad to think how serious people took that story, that they would go and do something like that. Yeah, or trespass on the property. Uh, with the current owners having to, you know, post it with all kinds of, you know, no trespassing. That property is easy to get onto. Very, I'm very sad to say. If I were speaking and giving an interview in the United States, I wouldn't even say that. I know that you have your listeners in the UK are not going to fly over to Rhode Island and see how quick and easy they can get onto that property. Um, you know, but the fact of the matter is, it's very exposed, and um, there was it was infiltrated. Uh, around the you know prior actually beginning when when the movie the first movie trailer came out in the United States is when it began um, and you know they've had a series of problems up there I don't think as much as is claimed but I do you know because I've seen the police records I, I know from the reports that uh, the visits have been relatively few and far between however that does not mean that people are not trespassing uh, on that property or imposing themselves on that property however the current owner has taken this um, uh, she has taken this light years uh, right after the movie came out. Um, she she went to the Associated Press and United Press International and, you know, waving her hands furiously, go away, no ghosts here. The parent family made all of it up. And she knows that's not true. She even went so far as to say publicly that I never told her there was going to be a film made when I have it on film discussing the forthcoming movie with her. Um, there are several uh, places. I mean, this is a woman who has been inviting uh, paranormal investigative teams to her home for decades, um, including the Ghost Hunters, which uh, you can see the Sutcliffe investigation, season two, episode seven uh, of the Ghost Hunters in the archives, um, where she admits 
that the house is haunted. Um, there have been numerous times, there are hours and hours, if people look around, we'll find hours of her talking endlessly about all the different, different experiences that she had in the house over the course of the decades, two decades plus that she has lived there. And yet when the film opened and she suddenly felt converged upon, you know, I, I can't say that I wouldn't say, go away, there are no ghosts here, okay, go away. But, you know, I mean, if I were living there and I felt like, you know, it, honestly, uh, I can understand uh, how she and her husband feel. I can, and I'm sorry for them, but I'm not responsible for it. I didn't do it to them. And um, she has, you know, virtually blamed me, put out some horrific YouTube videos calling my mother a liar, uh, saying we're all bad actors. I mean, oh, my God, Rita, honest to God, honey, you know me. You know, I spent seven years tethered to a freaking computer to tell our story that waited more than 30 years to be told. This was not something that I did for fame and fortune. She knows it. She chased my mother around. Let me tell you how I met Mrs. Sutcliffe. I met her in the late 80s, I believe, 1989. And she walked into the front door of my restaurant in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and she recognized my business partner, Gail. And she said, Gail, is that you? And Norma and Gail said, Norma, is that you? And Norma said, oh, my God, I haven't seen you in so long. Oh, my God, it, I'm, I didn't even know you owned this place. And she um, immediately said, you'll never believe I just bought a haunted house up on Round Top Road in Harrisville. That's how she introduced herself. Well, I dropped my knife. I was peeling potatoes in the kitchen. Yeah. I heard that through the little window, and I went flying out there because I knew exactly what house she was talking about. And we talked for hours, hours and hours. And then she started trying to get my mother to co-author a book with her and, you know, wanted to put all her experiences in and put my mother's experiences in. And my mother just kept saying, no, 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 no. And, you know, after more than two years... She stopped asking. Um, but, you know, we were friends. I used to have access to that farm whenever I wanted to go home. And that's what I always considered it, that I had gone home. Uh, and I loved it there. And I loved that she and her husband provided me that access, gave me, signed a piece of paper saying that I could use all the film footage I wanted, all the photographs I wanted to promote the books. I mean, couldn't have been more gracious, couldn't have been more obliging. And and when that movie came out, it she did a 180 like I have never seen the last person in the world that I thought would turn on me. I mean, she knew some of the deepest, darkest of our secrets. She knew things that weren't even in the books. I was quite surprised when I read online that she said the house wasn't haunted and they never experienced anything because I had actually just watched the YouTube video where you sitting down with her in the house and her telling stories. So the proof is there that she did say the house yeah. was haunted. Well, you know, I, uh, I wouldn't even think about lying and neither would anybody in our family about this. I mean, who would deliberately... Um, set themselves up, you know, yeah. for the kind of criticism that would be showered upon someone for divulging the details of our time at that house. Um, you know, I like I said, I can't worry about uh, those that uh, disparage my family. Uh, even those, you know, someone that I once considered a close friend. I mean, she fractured our relationship in one day, she has gone so far as to sue Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema for damages ensued, and they didn't even film the movie at her house. It was an entirely different house in an entirely different state. Um, you know, it's uh, Warner Brothers offered her security, and she turned them down flat. And then when she started making demands that she had to have it, they told her no, because she was not very nice to them. Uh, it could have gone a whole different way than it did. Uh, Norma is very well aware of the history of that house, yeah. of the history of our family in that house, has had numerous experiences herself. She has brought in near paranormal, rise up paranormal, the ghost hunters, 
uh, 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 gosh, I can't even think of the names of all the different paranormal teams that she's invited to her home. Without my knowledge over all those years, I was shocked when I saw that the farm was on Ghost Hunters, you know, the night that it aired. Everybody started calling me, isn't that your farm? Isn't that where you grew up? I was like, oh, my God. You know, um, no, she hasn't got a legal leg to stand on, in my opinion. Um, You know, I haven't done anything to hurt her. I don't ever do anything to deliberately hurt anyone. And she knows that this woman knows me very well. And it's a, it's a very uh, malevolent and insidious approach that she has taken to myself and my family uh, and to the movie makers uh, around this, as though I stood there and had oversight over every line of the script. I never saw anything of the script. I saw the movie, and I had no control over what happened with that. They were going to make the movie regardless. Um, it was in the pipeline for two years before I was approached. So, you know, no, she doesn't have a leg to stand on here. And she has gone at some point, she will have to eat her own words. And, you know, I'm sorry if that's, uh, you know, hard to swallow, but um, I'm not the liar. Well, I can understand a big, a big horror movie comes out like that. And loads of people are coming to your house. You can understand that that, you know, you're going to want that to stop, but it's not very fair to call someone else a liar when you appeared in a video with them saying that they're well, telling the truth. That's I know. Saying. You know, she's she's really tried to, I mean, she's right on the verge of, you know, trying to hurt my career. And I can't even say definitively that she hasn't in some respect. Um, you know, going and doing uh, local town hall meetings, which, I mean, they, they finally stopped her from that. Um, yeah doing all kinds of things. Uh, Last year, I was at the Ocean State Paracon, which was set at the Assembly Theater right in downtown Harrisville. And she she showed up. And, you know, we were there to raise money for a worthy cause. And she was there to cause a scene. And she did cause quite a scene and was removed from the premises for the things that she was saying in a room full of 300 people who were looking at her like she was out of her mind, throwing accusations at me up on the stage while I'm trying to speak. Um, you know, my father basically told her to shut up and sit down. Mm-hmm. And then the stage manager removed her from the building. I mean, she was there to cause a ruckus, to, um, you know, try to accuse me of making the whole thing up. Who, what person on the planet would literally sacrifice seven years of their life to tell a story in such incredible detail based on the memoirs of seven people and do that to the exclusion of all else. It took me seven years, start to finish, to publish those three books, to tell our whole story, to put it out into the world in the prime of my life. Really? But then, speaking of your books there now, I believe you have some exciting news about your books i do i do and uh you're the first one in the uk to hear about this i've only talked about it a little bit on my own radio show uh here in the states but um i'm currently working on a series of screenplays i'm i'm well into the first uh i've got a producer a director a wonderful screenwriter that i'm collaborating with to bring the trilogy of books house of darkness house of light legitimately to life on the silver screen and it will yes i'm thank you i'm so excited Uh, this is uh you know a project in development but i will tell you that i promise you Mm -hmm. and every single one of your listeners that when you go see And, you know, I don't even know if this is going to be one film, two films, three films. I mean, that's what they're shooting for. That's what the producers want, three films. Um, But I will promise everyone that there won't be anything fake. You know, and, you know, the story itself, Rita, you well know, the story itself is phenomenal enough. Mm. There is no need to make stuff up as we go along here. Um, You know, just following it, literally following it through the trilogy is enough to to blow the human mind wide open, to expand human consciousness in a way it has not been expanded before. Uh, And I'm, you know, I'm so thrilled to be able to share that with all of you and to tell you that, uh, you know, my hand before God, I will make sure that the story is told authentically. Um, There is nothing uh, that will be... um, 
There's not going to be any fluff. Yeah. There's, there's no need. There's absolutely no need for it. To a certain extent, in order to recreate the apparitions, there will have to be some kind of CGI employed. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, if I'm on the set, who knows who could show up? <laughs> <laughs> Well, also, Andrea, you mentioned there your radio show. You have your own podcast. Could you tell listeners about that? Well, I've just stepped away from it, and the inimitable Rosemary Ellen Guiley has taken the reins. Uh, George Lopez and I, a couple of years ago, founded a radio program called A World Awakening, and I did it with him for uh, a little over two years, and Rosemary picked up where I left off because I told him I cannot continue to do you know, countless interviews and and be tied down to an interview every Tuesday night. Mm-hmm. I felt like I had made a very valid contribution. Um, many, many people go back and listen to the archives. It is a wonderful show. And um, George and Rosemary um, changed it up a little bit. And it's now called A New World Awakening. And so that she, you know, could have her own stamp, her own personality on it as well. And um, she's just... Uh, you know, she's a personal friend. She's also um, a true paranormal scholar. This woman has published 63 books, um, with the 64th one in the pipeline. Uh, she is absolutely brilliant. Um, she is uh, so kind-hearted, such a lovely, lovely soul. And um, I'm sure that she and George will take it to another level. And, of course, I'll step back in anytime she's traveling or there's a need for me to be there. But I've been focusing all of my attention on getting this screenplay finished because it will be um, going to the Cannes Film Festival uh, in production meetings uh, in May. So, I've, you know, I've got a a tight deadline uh, and that's, you know, that's the plan. And the fact that you are doing that screenplay, it will be very, very difficult to stick to an interview every Tuesday because all the research and everything that goes into Doing an interview takes a lot of time up as well, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people don't know that. They think I just sit there for a couple of hours and chit-chat, but, yeah. you know, there's a lot that goes into booking them and, you know, the the back and forth, getting bio information, getting photographs, mm-hmm. getting everything together, doing the research, doing the background so that you do a proper introduction of an individual. You know, there's a lot involved with doing your own radio show. Yeah. And I loved it. It was my favorite two hours of every single week. I loved doing it. But I needed to throw myself into the screenplay. Um, and, you know, there's one other thing, too, Rita, that I really want to tell you about. And it's very, very important to me, honey. Um, I just published a book with George. Um, George Lopez. George R. Lopez. Not the stand-up comedian. The stand-up comedian of the paranormal. He is um, he is truly a, a brilliant man. And he brought an idea to me a couple of years ago, something that was in his head that I insisted that he need to write down. And together, we created uh, a a story, a novel called In a Flicker. Um, I am as proud of In a Flicker as I am of the trilogy. Uh, In some ways, it was more difficult to write. Uh, It is set in England, uh, predominantly. It is a labor of love a true labor of love, and there's nothing like it in print. It is also horrifying. It is gruesome. Um, It's difficult, truly difficult to read in terms of the emotional impact of it. Uh, It's about a story that people in England only think they know, Uh, but this brings them into the depth and the breadth and the truth of something that they thought they were familiar with and maybe are not. It will bring them an entirely different perspective um, on what is really something extricated directly from British history. I love In a Flicker because from its the depths of its darkness, it emanates a light, uh, a light of a true understanding, uh, human compassion, It opens up the heart and the mind in inexplicable ways. We've got nothing but five-star reviews of this book from around the world. It's only been out for a few months. And where is it available, Andrea? uh, You can get it from, it's available on Amazon. So you can go to amazon.com.uk and get it there. Uh, And also my, uh, my publisher, my publisher began as an English entity. 
Uh, so you can go directly to the bookstore at authorhouse.com.uk and they'll have it to you in no time because it's being printed right in the homeland. So, um, you know, that's the fastest way to get it. And it is, you know, I tell people, I, you know, I beg their pardon. Please understand what I'm saying to you. If you are uh, a very sensitive person, if you are, you know, what some might consider faint of heart, uh, please consider that before you read it, because it is not for the faint of heart. Um, the most gruesome elements of it are derived specifically from the historical record. But it is uh, a wild emotional ride, and people around the world are responding to it in uh, incredible ways. So, you know, I warn people, those that are really sensitive, those that are really tuned in, um, you know, this apparently is triggering some paranormal experiences for people. Uh, and I don't know why, but I will tell you that George Lopez is brilliant beyond measure. And I am a talented writer. And together, when we, I took his story and turned yeah. it into a novel, it is um, something spectacular, spooktacular. It has a wicked paranormal twist to it. Uh, it is supernatural in nature. It is ethereal in nature. It is extraterrestrial in nature. Well, for anybody who wants to keep up with all your projects, Andrea, where can people follow you on social media? I got a hopping Facebook page. Yeah. Um, in fact, I have several. Um, they can find me on A World Awakening and listen to any of the archived shows that I did with George um, right up till the last one that I did a couple of weeks ago. Um, they can find me. I have five Facebook pages, actually. My fan page is called The Buttercup Brigade, uh, which is a great collection of, of wonderful souls. Um, of course, the fan page for In a Flicker. Um, and uh, people should also visit our website, inaflickernovel.com, all lowercase, inaflickernovel.com. Uh, it is a great spot. Um, you can see all kinds of reviews and some videos and, and things that we've put together f to promote the book. It's a great place. Um, and then people can learn more about me at my website, which is houseofdarknesshouseoflight.com. Um, but I prefer that everybody come over to not only my book page, uh, House of Darkness, House of Light on Facebook, but also come to my personal page. And even though I've got 5,000 people on it and they won't let me have any more friends, quote unquote, um, I have uh, tens of thousands of followers, and uh, it's a great place to land in cyberspace. It's always a very uplifting and motivational spot for a lot of folks. Fantastic. Well, Andrea, as always, it's been such a pleasure having you on the show, and we'll definitely get you back on when that trilogy is coming to the screens. Oh, that's excellent, Rita. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to visit with you today. And the next time I'm on, I'm sure I'll have much more news to fill you in on. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. The Crypt Interviews in association with Mayo Legend Point Castle Bar.